Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Salmon Trout Steelheader Podcast. I have a special guest here today, uh, Jim Teeny, the fly fishing legend, and it is a pleasure to have you on the podcast, Jim. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. Absolutely. We have actually been here in the Lama Glass factory today, and it was a pleasure um, to, to see Jim and his wife, Donna, and uh, hang out with uh, Tom Posey as well, doing some reconnaissance on uh, some new four-piece fly rods that Jim had some insight on. So, Jim, first of all, I'd just like to get straight into it, and let's talk Chinook. So, what have you seen over the years? You've been fishing how many years now? Well, I started uh, fly fishing when I was 12, and I'm 75. 75, wow. <clears throat> you look so. 20 years younger. So, Jim, uh, when it comes to Chinook, if you could choose your ideal section of water, what would that look like for Chinook? What's your favorite type of water to fish? Well, you know, I, I like runs, but I also like seams, you know, where two currents come together and maybe there's some frog water. And then, uh, and so, I mean, because I've got our, our different fly lines that I designed, so like the mini tip is good for the seam water. Uh, our T-series type, they sink faster for the heavier water. But, I, but if I have the choice, and I can't always do that, but if I can spot them, then I'm, I'm really, then I can position myself and make good casts, good presentations, figure out the currents, you know, and the depth and what line would be the best one. So how essential is that um, line choice in actually hooking a fish? And in, you know, for, for instance, with something like a sink tip, how many different options are you going to choose from perhaps in a day? Well, you know, I might go uh, two or three different lines because if you move from one one uh, piece of water to another, uh, the current and depth and everything could change and, and you need to be able to change. I think lines are really, uh, really important uh, for being consistent and, and hooking numbers because I love to hook numbers of fish. I mean, so I'm not gonna, if I, if I have start out with a mini tip and I'm not getting down, I, I'm gonna be quick to change, you know, to go to a line that will sink. And, and of course, you know, when in the current, we use shorter leaders. We're only using about a, maybe a four foot leader on an average. And it doesn't have to be 48 inches. I mean, it can be 50 and it can be 40. It, but on an average, we use around four foot. When that, because when that sinking line's sinking and going down, it's taking the fly with it. So you get a longer, better presentation. Now, do you think Chinook are, by any means, uh, when it comes to fly fishing and in, in, in smaller rivers in particular, do you find them line shy or are they more apt to take most tippet sizes? Well, I, I don't think they're uh, really line shy. I think they target in on your fly and and uh, with our teeny flies, we use twos, fours, and sixes. But when the water, like you had said, say it was low and clear, we, we uh, use mostly sixes, which is, seems like a smaller size, which it is, but it's, uh, uh, they really readily accept that. And so when we're, and we're dead drifting, we're, you know, we're going with the speed of the current, we're not stripping or anything else like that. So it really, uh, it's just a good way to consistently present the fly to the fish. And then I, I do a lot of line watching as the line's drifting. And then if I have my polarized glasses on and I can see in the water, quite often you can see them actually open their mouth or turn their head and take the fly. And uh, how often, it, say you're sight fishing, what's been your experience of seeing the fish take it as opposed to feeling the fish take it? Or do you usually see it um, before you feel it? Or is it the other way around? Um, usually, um, you know, I mean, if you're just casting and doing a downstream uh, swing, so you've cast out and your line's drifting and now you're swinging, uh, you don't always see those fish, but you feel it because those are the really hard, aggressive ones. What I'd like to share with people is that most, I mean, you'd be surprised how many fish you actually miss when they pick up your fly. And if the line isn't tight, that, that they can mouth it and you don't even feel them, and then, then all of a sudden they spit it out again. I mean, I've watched this, I've been able to watch this quite a bit, and, then all, and I've learned from that. So it's not always that you need to keep a tight line, but you need to line watch as it's, as it's moving along. 
So it's very, very important because uh, if you know that, and then what I also like to do is keep my rod tip at the angle of the uh, low to the water, and I follow my line as it's drifting because that way I'm more direct to the fly. You know, rather than having a high stick, you know, my, my rod up too high, then you have the belly in the fly line. Uh, you, you mentioned line watching. When it comes to line watching, is there any difference between a take and then perhaps just bumping bottom or something? You know, can you tell? Well, you know what, I think when we fish, we, we um, you can't always tell, but, uh, but you want to fish kind of a little bit nervous. Like, if you feel like it's a leaf or a rock or a limb or, I mean, you really should react to it, just in case, because not all fish take the same way. Some just pick it up and stop it. Some pick it up and drift with it. Some, you know, some will will just smash it. And I've caught a lot of I've caught a lot of steelhead and salmon as the fly hits the water and it's just starting to sink. And it's not even when I think they're going to take it right away. And boom, there's one on. You know, really early. So uh, you just have to kind of tune in to what you're doing and pay attention. Now, what have you seen over the years since you've been fishing in terms of uh, Chinook sizing? I was able to spend some time with you talking to you about this in the plant, about some of the sizes of Chinook over the years. What have you seen and about what time did you start seeing those differences? Well, I can tell you at least right now they're midgets <laughs> down here. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't remember seeing eight to 12 pound spring Chinook, you know, and, and um, and now the, the size average is way down, and I don't know what they're doing, but um, we, used to, we used to get some really big ones, big springers, big fall Chinook, uh, monsters, and the numbers. And so, you know, I just, I don't know, it's just, uh, it's not the same anymore, and I, and I think that we have a real good chance to build back our runs because the Columbia River system and all of our coastal in Washington and Oregon we have, we have some of the finest waters and rivers in the world, and with the Columbia River system, we could, we could build back and have as good a runs as anywhere in the world if they would do that, if they would work in that direction. And, um, and, and I'm not trying to be political, but we have a little bit too many seals and sea lions at the mouth of the Columbia. They are running a huge intercept. And, uh, and it really does take a toll. Now, have you seen any relation between, say you've got similar conditions, you know, Chinook fresh out of the salt, a couple days out of the salt, somewhat near tidewater. Have you seen any relation to the size of the fish um, in, in how much they're willing to bite or how aggressive they are? Well, you know, I really haven't uh, uh, experienced that. I mean, I think, I think if, it's been our it's been our uh, pattern that if we can find the fish and we can see them or we know they're there, uh, we usually figure it out how to hook them. And you know, and, and I, 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 I originated our, our teeny fly back in May of '62, and I kept it a secret for nine years, and it was originally a trout fly. But but uh, when we started fishing for steelhead with them, and then salmon, I had no idea it was going to work like it is. And now we've got different colors and things like that. So I have the I have 100% confidence that if the fish are there, that we're gonna we're gonna have a good shot at hooking them. Now let's switch uh, gears a little bit. Let's go over to steelhead. Um, what uh, what have you seen in terms of how far, let's say, summer steelhead? Um, how much of it, you know, how far is a steelhead willing to go to chase down a fly? What kind of proximity do you have to get? Well, you know the sum, the summer steelhead. Um, one, th these are I'm going to just run through a couple of things. That one thing when you're when you're summer steelhead fishing, if you're fishing some of the smaller rivers, you know, like and uh, water's low and clear, fish can see you. Uh, the worst two colors to ever wear for a t-shirt is white or yellow, because the sun really and they they can really see. I mean, they have great eyesight, you know, so, uh, and then also uh, the amount, uh, the point of when you've spotted them, you, we've always tried to keep our eye on them, and so that, because sometimes they might move and disappear and then you don't see them anymore, and then, and then you, you make your cast to present the fly to them, 
I think that the summer steelhead are probably not as spooky as the winter steelhead. The winter steelhead seem to be a little more skittish, and so, uh, but uh, on the other hand, you've got a little more water volume, you don't always see them, and then you're fishing the deep green slots or the runs or the tail outs and things like that. Um, so there, I think our experience has been that summer steelhead will allow you to approach and stick around a little longer. Winter runs, maybe not so. Now, let's talk about the, the spook factor, again, kind of going back to Chinook. What if you found, um, say you're sitting on a decent pot of Chinook, how spooky do you think they get in, in fairly, fairly visible water, like fall Chinook, something like that? Well, the, the kings are the kings are king and there's a reason they're so big and they don't really fear a lot of things i mean so i i i believe that um once once we find them and then we can make that cast and presentation to them and then we watch their uh, reactions uh, i'd like to i'd like to uh, share something with you though on steelhead and salmon if you make a cast out and the fish move out of the way of your line. It's not that they're moving out of the way of the fly, it's that your line, they see the shadow of your line coming down. If that happens, normally you need to go to a longer leader because you don't want the line to come over the fish, you just want the fly to come down and present. So if they're moving out of the way, then eventually they'll move back, then that's a signal to you that maybe I need to go to a little bit longer leader. And, and I've learned that through the years on experience, that that's really important. So it's kind of interesting to me that um, in the world of Chinook fishing, and certainly in the bigger rivers out of boats, and um, just kind of common knowledge, so to speak, it's always been, you know, bigger is better, of course, you know, going with big plugs and big baits of eggs and all that sort of stuff. But you're kind of taking a whole different approach to kings. Do you think that is part of the success and maybe why you're able to fish over fish that have been pressured before? I believe I believe it really has a, a strong factor. I think that, you know, like maybe you could go to a spot and you could have a big fly on or a big lure, boom, and you get one or two and then all of a sudden they shut down. But with our with our, our flies, you know, the ones that we're using, they're, they're not scaring them. And then if they're curious, the fish have to the only way, they don't have hands or anything, so they have to pick it up. If they're, they're wondering what it is and it's coming down, and we've, I, I, I honestly, I just want to share with you, I've had at least three days in my life, and I think it's a bigger number, that I've hooked over 50 kings in a day. And not that I landed them all, but I've <laughs> had them on and fighting, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and whether it's been Alaska or it's been Washington or, or down in, in Oregon, uh, those are big number days for kings. I mean, if you went bluegill fishing and you got 50 bluegill, you'd be, wow, this is a good day. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. so, but but we're geared for this. I mean, that's, a, that's why we're going out and we're using the right tackle. We're using the right rods, the right lines, the strong leaders. You know, our hooks are really strong on our teeny flies, so we know that we're not going to, you know, we're not going to have any defects in what we're doing. Uh, and so... And, and the bottom line is it gets down to presentation. If you make it look like it's something that they're going to want to take, and a lot of times fish are territorial, so here's something coming down through their territory. They don't like that. And, and if they're going to be curious, they're going, to, they're going to pick it up. But I've watched big kings up in Alaska, which is really fun. I've watched big kings as my line's coming down, my fly's coming down. I've watched them drift back and swing with the fly. And just, I mean, I see this big shadow just moving back and back and back, and all of a sudden my rod just goes down. I mean, yeah. honest to God, it's so exciting, you know. That is. I, I myself have never fly fished for kings, um, primarily in the tributaries, bait fishing, spinner fishing. Um, and this holds great interest to me. It's a little bit in, intimidating, so to speak, because it, it does require such finesse. I did see one time with uh, a friend... Uh, sitting on a bunch of kings, we had tried everything in our power to get him to bite. He puts on a steelhead float and a little 
tiny black jig, like a 64 ounce black jig with a white head. And I saw that Sh Chinook open up its mouth and inhale that jig. Wow. And it just blew me away. So I, have n I, haven't wa I haven't fished with you. I haven't seen this in person, but I guess I've seen that little anecdotal evidence. When, so was this, you came upon this by accident, trout fishing and steelhead fishing, or what is it? No, the, the, uh, the first Kings on a Fly was, uh, was back in the early 70s. And I was up on the Kalama River. My, mm -hmm. my uh, friend Don Anderson and I were going to head up to the Kispiox River in uh, BC for steelhead. So we were in training, is mm -hmm. what we said. <laughs> so we went down and we were at, uh, oh, the right below Pritchard's, the, yep. uh, there, I'm trying to think of the name of the run. But anyway, we were there and we had spotted some steelhead. So we were fishing for them and all of a sudden, the hole filled up with these fall Chinook. I mean, they just came in and took over. Of course, the steelhead, they won't lay there with a king. So they all moved off to their side little pockets and different things like that. We were pretty upset about it. and <laughs> But then we started hooking these kings. And at the end of the day, I think Donnie and I, we broke, I think we broke one or two fly rods and lost a couple of fly lines. And I mean, we're driving back home, and uh, and I said, "Geez, that was a lot of action." <laughs> you know what I mean? And that, I mean, and that was when I I first had an encounter with a king salmon on a fly, and and I've honestly I've caught several thousand now be, wow. through the years because you know you're going back to the mid '70s and or early '70s actually for that, and then uh, it was um, and I got and I'm really. I don't know, there's something about those fish because they're really powerful. Now my wife Donna, uh, <clears throat> she's caught them over 50, but she'd rather fish sockeyes. Yeah, you know, because <laughs> you, know, yeah. you can fight them and land them and, yeah. you know, without all the effort and everything like that. But I mean, it's not that you're, they're not hard to get, but yeah. uh, they fight. But the, the king salmon, there's a certain amount of love that I have for those fish and, they're, and respect because they're tough. And when you when you set up, and then you uh, you get one into the shore, and you actually get hand around the tail, you you pat yourself on the back and say, "I did it." <laughs> yeah. So. Now, um, again, thank you for for being on the podcast, and we'll wrap it up here. But could you uh, could you give me your with with no relation to actual flies or sizes or anything like that, just your three favorite colors for steelhead? For steelhead. Um, and it'd have to be insect green, black, and probably antique gold. Antique gold. And those are our those are our those are three deadly summer runs. Yeah. But the first two, the black and the insect green, are really good on summers and winters. And Donna favors the black. I like the insect green and antique gold. Uh, but there's times that the ginger will really be good, and that's like an off white. And that one there, you can visual, you can see it in the water. Mm -hmm. Nothing, none of our flies show up better than the ginger. So if you're really trying to be accurate and precise, you can cast out the fly, let it sink, and you can watch it move along. That is interesting. Yeah. You know, it's funny how the same fish, same runs, and the difference between a fly angler's um, color, you know, favorite colors, and, and a jig angler's favorite colors. You know, in the, in, oh, the, yeah. in the jig world, it's pinks, red, cerise, you know. Well, if we if we were on, uh, say we were on the Oregon coast, mm -hmm. or, and we were after uh, fresh run steelhead, yep. just coming in, uh, quite often they, they do like the pink and the orange and the chartreuse. Yeah. And the purple, yep. you know. But but on, on an average, on like summer runs, I mean, those those ones I just told you, they're deadly. Oh, man. You know, and, and they're also deadly on trout. So For that sure. you can, they come, they, they can combine, you know, to do both. But, well, that is great. So where, where can people find those flies and, and, uh, and take a look at some of the colors that you're mentioning? Well, if they go to our, our website, like .com, uh they should be able to find everything there, you know, that we have. And, and, um, and then all, and also I want to mention, uh, just something real quick that, uh, Years ago, uh, 
Nick Amato and Donna and I mm -hmm. and, and Nick's wife, we were up on the Alagnac and we, uh, we got a chance to fly fish for the big kings and everybody did really well. We had a great trip. So that's awesome. Would you, uh, you guys land any memorable fish up there? Yes, we, we uh, landed fish over in the probably at least the mid 50s. Wow. Yeah, we wow. were we were racking them up some big ones, but they also racked us up too. We didn't land them all, <laughs> you know. I mean, but yeah. it was it was it was a challenge. It was fun, uh, and it was really good company. And and uh, you know, being here also at at the Lamaglass uh, plant here with with uh, Tom Posey is really uh, it's a privilege for us because uh, with Dick Posey uh, we were dear great friends and I remember when he was repping and then he took over you know came here and uh, to see what Lamaglass has done and what they're doing and they're going to do is very very impressive and we're really happy and proud of the company yeah it's pretty incredible development and again that is J-I-M-T-E E N N Y dot com. Uh -huh. Jim Teeny yeah. dot com. You guys can take a look at those uh, flies. Keep an eye out for the new Lamb Glass fly rods coming out that are in development with Jim um, being, uh, you know, kind of a primary reference and rod consultant, essentially. And so many years of experience. Looking forward to fishing with those. Jim, thank you so much for being on the Salmon Trout Steelheader podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me in, in tight lines. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, guys. Go ahead and uh, tell your friends. Comment on this. We'd uh, love to have more of you telling us what you think of the Salmon Trout Steelheader podcast. Go ahead. Check us out at SalmonTroutSteelheader.com as well as FTJAngler.com. Fly Fishing and Tying Journal, our sister publication. So much good information there on fly fishing and... We will see you guys next time.